just wet the rice. Um, hi everyone. Um, I hope everybody is doing fine today. So, as I promised last week, we talked about the al algae products, and today we're going to talk about the regulatory aspects of it. And I have Dr. Sor uh, that is going to uh, talk about all the nitty and gritty stuff about regulatory and re regulatory requirements when it comes to algae products. The, um, I think Greg can speak uh, more about his bio and the work that he has done. So I'll give the ship to you to navigate. All right. Thank, thank you so you much, much, Greg. Appreciate it. Uh, today, we're going to go over the regulatory considerations for uh, algae products. That includes both food ingredients and chemical products and where they overlap. Uh, this I didn't plan it this way, but this morning there was a bit of a news item that that uh, it's very important that you you hear about it, you understand exactly what happened, and or well, as much as we know now, so that you have some idea when if you're working with algae products, you can see how it might impact your business. Uh, this morning I saw on uh, oh by the way, laptops, smartphones. You need to Google while I'm talking, being whatever, please do. And if it prompts questions, feel free to ask me. There's a lot of this stuff that is kind of a, I'll be touching on it, but if you want to get into it a little bit more, uh, if you look something up and want to ask me about it, I encourage that. I think it actually be easier. We have an hour and 15 minutes and I'd rather not talk every single second of that. So I would welcome the questions. One of the things you can look up is a product called Soylent. And except a couple of us, maybe. Um, Soylent Green. It's Soylent Green. Uh, that's from the, I think is a 19, early 1970s movie with Charlton Heston. And what happened actually is some folks in Silicon Valley decided they'd like to do a version of Soylent that was a meal replacement. Then they could work at their computers all day and wouldn't have to get up and eat. What they did was they included a number of different ingredients to get their protein and their nutrients and build this meal replacement. This morning, they announced that, uh, well, a, a while back they had a recall. Some folks were getting nauseous and vomiting off of the product. And this morning they announced that they think they'd figured out what it was. And it was, they think, their algal flour that they were adding to the soylent. The algal flour was, uh, was provided by uh, Terravia, who was uh, recently, I think uh, spring of this year, actually called Solozyme. And Solozyme had a number of products that were in the pipeline for review by FDA. And they went through the entire process and they had some hiccups, but they eventually worked it out and they got to market in a way that most people actually don't bother to do as much as they did. And I'll, we'll go through that a little bit, and I'll show you where other folks take what I think are shortcuts and what can be uh, problematic for the, both their products and, I think, the industry. But Solozyme actually did a much more aggressive uh, program that isn't required under U.S. regulations. They went beyond that, and they still had an issue. My concerns are when you have something like this happen, it can actually taint the whole industry. Unlike when, you know, a Trader Joe's has a recall, people think that it was Trader Joe's problem. But when you have an algae product that's recalled, it can affect what people think of all algae products because we don't yet have any brand recognition. So I think this, this talk is going to highlight uh, some of the work that Solazime had done, what other folks are doing, and how other people, uh, how they can get to market both as a food and as a chemical product. Another quick uh, caveat on the intro here is uh, this summer, Congress actually did a huge, huge step for chemical safety regulation, and they passed a reformed TOSCA, the to Toxic Substances Control Act, and that hadn't been updated in 40 years. So that ushered in an entirely new era of chemical regulation in the United States. So you guys 
are kind of on the forefront of all the new regulation. And this is where it's nice to, to understand all the new stuff because if you get out there and someone's talking about the regulatory issues in your, uh, in your next job, if they're, older, if they're older than you, they may not know all the new regulations. You will probably have the insight that they don't. Um, Craig, I'm sorry, I forgot to give the bio to you. Right, I'm just moving yeah, into that. I just wanted to get this out there real yeah, quick. Sure, so what do I do and how do I know these things and how is that relevant to all of this? Well, I'm Dr. Greg Sauer. I have a PhD in toxicology and I evaluate the safety of chemicals and food substances that are coming onto the market in the US and Europe and Canada. It's kind of a weird job and I didn't go to school to get it. And you kind of find out about these things after you're out looking for work. And you find like, well, I'm qualified for that, kind of, right? And you find <laughs> completely unexpected career paths. Uh, but it's been very interesting because not a lot of folks know this. And I've been working at, uh, I've been going to the ABO, the algae uh, conferences and uh, chemical conferences and toxicology. And everyone seems to know their segment, but few people know how they overlap. And what I do is I bring together the scientists, the engineers, and the regulators into the same room, into the same, on the same report, and help them talk to each other. And so I help people get products to market, and I help the regulators understand what products are coming and what issues there may be. This is a three-legged stool that supports your product. If you saw this as three legs, your product would sit right on top. You lose one of these legs and you have a potential marketability issue with your product. One is obvious, regulatory compliance. You have to have that. You have to comply with the laws and regulations. The other is pretty obvious as well, mark, uh, product safety. If the stuff isn't safe, it's not going to get to market or it may be pulled from market. The third is something a lot of folks maybe overlook. Uh, it's something I think is important to the story uh, in the news this morning, which is market acceptance. The Solazyme product, the uh, Teravia, had regulatory compliance and they had done a bunch of product safety. Their potential issue here is market acceptance. That can be what's compromised by this situation. And this is where, when, when these start to overlap, uh, one comes out and the whole stool falls and your product collapses. Uh, we can look outside of algae and think of something like bisphenol A. I don't really see any Nalgene containers in here, but, well, there's one, I guess, a polycarbonate. But when I was in grad school, it was, you know, it was Oregon, and you were practically required to have an algae part of your uniform. But as soon as the public became concerned about bisphenol A, the first person who put a polycarbonate bottle out there and said it's BPA-free, nailed it. They get the market share. They get the attention. It doesn't matter what happens with BPA on the regulations. It doesn't matter if FDA doesn't pull it. It doesn't matter if the product safety is still there. Your market acceptance is gone and your product is compromised. So these have a lot of words on them. I'm going to kind of blaze through them a little bit because you guys have them. They're intended for the folks who aren't here. They're intended for looking at it later. I'd like to keep this a little bit more conversational so we won't try to read everything, but you can use it for you know, uh, reference. So what we're going to do here is take a look at your three-legged stool in another way. FDA, EPA, and USDA. I'm going to focus on where FDA and EPA overlap. Again, algae is unique here uh, for a number of reasons, but a lot of what a lot of the food ingredients are also commercial industrial chemicals, thousands of them. A lot of people don't like the idea of industrial chemicals being in their food or coming from the same source, but they don't realize if you're moving towards something green, the whole idea is getting more plant-based and renewable industrial chemicals. They're probably going to come from something that we already think is safe, like food sources. So we're going to see more and more overlap between FDA and EPA. One of the key issues for you to know is that if you're entering the market as an FDA product, then it is regulated entirely separately from anything that you put on the market 
as an EPA product. And that is uh, difficult for a lot of folks to grasp down to the point where you can have separate places in the warehouse, separate warehouses, separate supply chains, everything. When you're making every when you're making your algae or the products from it on one site, it can get very complicated very quickly. For the folks looking in manufacturing or engineering, that's important to keep in mind when you're building your facility. So EPA, FDA, USDA, what are you actually going to be making? Is it a food, a drug, or a cosmetic? That's FDA. Is it industrial chemical? That's EPA. And if it's an agricultural material, that's USDA. That seems pretty obvious. You can split it up three ways. Well, what about something like mineral oil? You put mineral oil into food, and you also use it as an industrial chemical. So right there, you've got FDA, EPA overlap. Those are the kinds of things that we'll be taking a look at. Here's what you really need to ask yourself about the product. What is it? How well can you characterize it chemically, physically? Is there a history of its use as a food, as an industrial chemical? What safety data do you have? Have you done any toxicology testing? Has anybody else? And not just on the product itself, the chemical itself, but on any impurities, residuals, or byproducts that might be in it. Who's the intended consumer? Are you going to be selling to someone like BASF? and you don't know how they're going to use it, they may end up using it in two different ways, or are you going to uh, market it directly under your own brand and you know that you're going to target very specific consumer cross-section? And when do you want to get this to market? A, a lot of people get upset with lawyers, think they muddle things up and make things complicated. It's been my experience that, that lawyers are often trying to help marketers figure things out because everybody sets the deadline for when this product hits the market and maybe they haven't exactly taken into consideration what the regulatory timeline to get it approved is actually going to be and what might come up and slow that down. Oh, Also right there I quickly uh, I left this off. What agency? Identify the agency offhand. Almost every one of the agencies you can go and have you can have a pre-market consultation with these folks. So whether, whether you just want to ask a few questions or tell them exactly what you're doing and whether they have concerns, get a hold of them. I mean, as soon as you start working with these guys, you'll be on a first name basis with them. They're all accessible. They all have their own phone numbers. It's actually quite easy. Let's take a look at uh, FDA for a moment. And again, if uh, I'm going to give you the, the GRN inventory. So that probably doesn't mean anything to you just yet, but if you look up FDA and GRN, you'll find the inventory. And one of the best examples is the Solozyme uh, GRN. What they did is they had to get very specific on their algae genus, species, whatever else there, there was to identify that specific variety, that, that very algae, as, as well as they could define it. <coughs> they also have to highlight the manufacturing process, and I don't think theirs was GMO, but any GMO details are applicable. What foods and fortification levels? You want to put it into meal replacements? You want to put it into energy bars? That's a certain category. People eat a certain amount of those. We can evaluate that. I do evaluate that, and I say, if you want to put it in at five grams, people eat so many energy bars, that's going to get to an unsafe level. So we think maybe you either back off or change change your market. That's the type of work we do. That gives you your estimated dietary intakes. If you have safety studies, you can compare the estimated daily intake, how much people are eating, with what the rats ate. If the rats ate a whole ton of the stuff and everything was fine, then you can probably get a higher EDI. And keep that in mind when you're eating your food. How much did the rats have to suffer through to get to that level that's in your chow? And the safety studies are not the same as efficacy studies. Efficacy studies are where you say, if people eat this, it lowers their blood sugar, and they're less likely to get diabetes. 
you're trying to show how efficacious your substance is at controlling blood sugar. What isn't getting measured is how it affects every other part of your body. Some people might take the toxicological data at the same time, most don't. You know, you know, those studies you can sign up for and they say, we'd like five people to take this for a month and tell us how they slept. That's not a safety study. One of the biggest issues for us when we evaluate these materials is people will drop 10, 15 studies and tell us, look at all the work we've done. Not one of them is a safety study. All that money might be useful for their product as far as a, a selling point or marketing, but it's completely useless from a safety standpoint. And then even for food contact substances, if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking to be a mineral oil that goes into a paper product or something like that, uh, if you're looking to, if you can come up with something from your algae that makes paper grease resistant so you can wrap a hamburger or fries in it, you're going to make a lot of money, but you're going to do a lot of work demonstrating that it doesn't migrate at an unsafe level into your food. And then, of course, we can throw in the environmental assessment, assessment potentially, unless it's exempt. So you can go to FDA and still have environmental assessment work to do. You can also go to EPA and end up doing food work. I have a sure. So <clears throat> about what is the safety level of um, special ingredients in a food that how much people were going to eat? So where do you get the, the, the data for that? So if you put this ingredient in a food, in a bar, energy bar, and you know how much an adult will eat, where the data is coming from? There is a uh, database that is now with the CDC. It started out with USDA, and it's called NHANES. And it's the Nutritional Health and, no, the National Health and Nutrition uh, Examination Survey. And what that does is they call a bunch of people, and they say, what did you eat in the last two days? And they record it all, and they sort through it. Every so often, you'll see a study on the news that says uh, Americans are getting this much BPA in their diet. What they did often is they looked at either the chemicals or the foods that people were ingesting in the NHANES database, and then they did some math and evaluation. It's a huge database. There's a lot of information in there. And a lot of people mine it to get to get studies. You can send a grad student into NHANES and uh, with one question, and say you should be able to get a paper out of this. But um, so it is government data that we work with. But we don't have to do that exclusively. There's some other token ways. Thank you. If you're going into a dietary supplement, it's a little different than if you're going into a food, a food ingredient. The dietary supplement is composed of new dietary ingredients or old dietary ingredients. If you're making something from an algae or it's the algae itself, it's probably a new dietary ingredient and you have to notify the government that you're going to use it. Ostensibly, it takes 75 days after your submission and you get an objection or no objection. Sounds pretty straightforward. Here's where it gets a little weird. If you're going into a food ingredient, technically you don't have to go to FDA at all. Solozyme went to FDA and FDA came back with some questions and they said well, they'll, they'll address it. And they addressed them and they went back and FDA said we have more questions. And Solozyme did more work, more money. And they went back. You don't have to do that. You can actually have someone like me look at it, do a safety evaluation, call it grass, generally recognized as safe, and you can go to market. Again, without FDA ever looking at your product. You can also do the voluntary grass notification. That's the GRN, grass notification, and that all of those are on an inventory at FDA's site. And you can see what FDA had to say about it. Now, FDA doesn't approve or reject those. Things change. The science changes. They don't want to get pinned down to saying, yes, this stuff is safe. 
what they say is, we don't have any questions at this time, which means you can go to market as a GRN. Technically, you could have already been on market and then done the GRN. But the thing to consider with that is if you're going to sell your product to a big name, why would they go buy the why would they buy it from you if you haven't gone to the FDA? If you go to the FDA, you can point to you can tell anyone you want to sell it to, go look at the website, you'll see our product, and FDA has already commented on it. So what you're going to see there is less FDA driven regulation and enforcement and more market driven. The customers decide who they want to buy from and what is required. So don't be surprised if you want to get to market early, you can do it with your, with your grass uh, determination, but you may find that you have to build up to the GRN to get people to accept it. So what's in a grass notification or a, uh, even a grass determination? That's where you take all the information about your product, you evaluate the safety, and you find yourself an expert panel. And you get these folks who are trained by education and experience, that's the regulatory language, to assess the safety of ingredients and foods. That's it. It doesn't say they have to be PhDs. It doesn't say you have to have five, six, or ten of them. It just says they have to be trained by education and experience. The other fun thing you can do, probably more fun for me than for you, but is to get on the GRN inventory and look at the people that they've gone to for these expert panels. And you can do your own determination as to whether you think they're qualified. Does someone who is a CEO or a CTO or something in a company that is making the product, are they qualified to make the determination? Or is that a conflict of interest? The General Accountability Office thinks that's a conflict of interest, but there's not a law against it. So you will see people who work within the company making determinations. Now, what if they pay me? I'm a third party. If they pay me, is that a conflict of interest that my salary is based on what I come up with for these for my client? Personally, I think that's a conflict of interest. So what we do is we, we build the safety evaluation and then we present it to another group of experts and we identify people we think that might be in the field uh, with the, the latest and greatest information and expertise. If we're making something that goes in infant formula, we probably want some infant formula PhDs and probably a pediatrician on there. So that's what we do when we build an expert panel. You can look and you'll find some people are veterinarians, which if you're going for an animal grass, which there is, animal grass notification, then that seems like that would be appropriate. Maybe not so much on the human side. Regardless, FDA has 180 days to review it. That's not a limit. They can take as long as they want. Uh, I've had some finish in 180 days, and I've had some you know, take over a year. You go to the, F, the EPA side. Did anyone go to the, did you happen to attend the uh, MCAN uh, talk over in Tempe? EPA was here talking about what they wanted to see. Uh, I didn't make it to that. That's probably, this is off of their, um, this is off of an EPA uh, document on what they wanted to see, but they might have revised it or made it more specific for algae. Uh, you can talk to folks here, um, ask Hattie or some other folks who might have, uh, might have heard the specifics. But this is a little different. They want to know the construction details, taxonomy, of course, again, construction details if it's a GMO, get used to that. Human health effects, environmental effects, how much you're making, what are any of the byproducts, and specifically what you intend to use it in and how. And then the obvious forms <laughs> for exposure and environmental releases, if it gets out, what's its expected survival, how far is it supposed to be dispersed, what do you have if it does get out? Is there any environmental release issue or an emergency issue? Seems pretty straightforward, but a lot of this has been revised because other folks have come to EPA and done that. Uh, 
thing to note here is I'm talking predominantly about the algae itself. But if you're making a chemical from the algae, then you just step down, skip those first two, and go into the human health effects. And everything else is the same. They want to know how you make it, what you're going to use it in, and, and how much you're going to produce. This stuff just got a lot more difficult this summer with the new regulation. EPA wants to know exactly what you're going to use it in and how much you're going to be making and when they add it. So there's this, if you're a chemical, if you're an uh, analogy, there's this big inventory of all the chemicals used in the United States. They're in commercial activity that aren't R&D. You want to be on that inventory so that you can market it. And that's what we're going to get into next here is the uh, getting yourself to market, which is by way of getting it on the inventory. <coughs> you do a pre-manufacturing notice or a microbial commercialization and the MCAN or the PMN. If you're doing the chemical, it's the PMN. If you're doing a, an organism, it's the MCAN. But when you do that, you're going to give all that information to EPA. And EPA is going to evaluate the use and the exposures to consumers, to the workers, and the environment. And they're going to make it. A, they're going to make one of three determinations. And this is new. This is new for uh, TSCA reform, which is the Lautenberg Act. They're going to say it's okay for these uses. We have no concerns. And they're going to publish that on the web. They didn't used to do this. Or they're going to say, we don't have enough information to decide. So you just you need to go back and get some more data for us. And they'll tell you what data they want. Or they're going to say, it's an unreasonable risk. That's it. Those are your three choices. Ostensibly, and this is, this is, the, same under, um, this is the same under Lautenberg as it was under the old Tosca. So it's going to take them at least 90 days. Right now, you can expect double that. They're just overwhelmed. These guys, they can't keep up with all the changes right now. This just hit them in June, and they've been trying to catch up since. But what this does is this gets you on the Tosca inventory. So you have two things. You have grass and the grass notification inventory, and you have the Tosca inventory. You want to be on an inventory. If you're there, if you get to the Tosca inventory, your chemical can be introduced by anybody now. If you're on the grass inventory, that's not necessarily true. There are some older documents up there that just say something like spirulina. And so people think, oh, spirulina is grass. Keep in mind that with EPA and with FDA both now, exactly what the fortification level is, what the, what the uses are, and how people are exposed is what's grass or on the inventory. Not the substance, just, not just the substance itself, but how you're using it and how you're manufacturing it. Those are extremely important aspects. So if you have a proprietary way of making your particular algae, you want to put that into your grass determination or your PMN because, and your uses as well because that will help shut other people out. You can use it to a competitive advantage. This is regulatory work, but it's, just, it's not just a hurdle. It's also a way to protect your market share if you use it correctly. So this is an, another tough one for algae. Um, you have facilities that process foods. Under the Bioterrorism Act, you have to register as a food production facility. You have to do that before you do anything. Then there's farms that make raw agricultural commodities. Uh, you guys can kind of fit in there both, right? If you're doing spirulina, and spirulina is more of a crop, aren't you kind of more of a farm? But if you're taking the facility and you're using all these, you're using bioreactors producing a certain algae, you pull them out, you separate out the algae, uh, the algae into its respective components, you have it genetically modified to make certain chemicals the industry wants and they don't want to use a petroleum source. 
and you're really a pretty advanced manufacturing facility, not a farm. The problem for you right now is algae is not recognized as a farm. And that has implications under FDA for the Food Safety Modernization Act. So we'll start getting into a little bit of that. EPA is pretty cut and dried. If it's a chemical, we don't care where you got it. If it's new to commerce, it's a new chemical. So again, here we have Tosca. That's the one, when I say EPA, you may as well just hear Tosca. FDA is the uh, Federal Food Drugs and Cosmetics Act, or F FFDCA or FDCA. You'll hear it both ways. And then EPA is also FIFRA for your pesticides. Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Keep in mind that includes antimicrobials. If you want to put, uh, you know, an organic silver substance in the socks to keep them from smelling, that's FIFRA. But we're going to focus on Tosca and FDCA. That's where you're going to find the big chunk and a lot of the overlap. And here's that overlap I was talking about with a key example. You have adipic acid. That's a monomer in the production of nylon, and it's a food ingredient that modifies the flavor and texture. This is where people start getting creeped out. Uh, has anyone heard of uh, the food babe? Uh, fun website. She's crazy. Um, maybe you remember that uh, someone was trying to get a uh, compound taken out of Subway bread. Last year they said it's in bread and it's in yoga mats. And they said you don't want to chew on a yoga mat while you're eating your sandwich, right? So let's get that out of there. FDA was fine with this stuff. It's not a hazard. But conceptually, that was the end of it. You, are you algae or are you pond scum? You know, it can come down to that, and you really want to be careful about marketing it and how it's perceived. But uh, that compound's used in yoga mats for the same reason it's used in bread. It makes the bread light, fluffy, and chewy. It makes your, your yoga mat nice, nice and comfy and soft. But it was just people didn't want to think of going to yoga class and then getting their Subway sandwich and having them both be the same thing. When you are working with something like this, which I hope a lot of you end up doing. I hope the industry does a lot more of. We need to see a lot more of it. There's so much opportunity. We should talk about that sometime. It's another lecture. But there's so much opportunity to have algae produce a lot of the chemicals that we need or specific ones that we can't quite easily get. Modify it and get it for us. Uh, quick story. Uh, probably one of my best GRNs uh, to date. It's on there. I think it's, um, oh, I don't remember the number now. It's 571, I think. These folks genetically modified an E. coli to produce a complex sugar that occurs in human breast milk because cow's milk doesn't have it. Cows have a completely different digestive system than we do. Why would we use cow's milk in an animal that is just not the least bit like us to feed our babies. It just didn't make any sense. And they're like, well, why don't we just take the sugars that occur in human breast milk, modify E. coli so that it can make it, then we'll separate that stuff out and we'll put that in formula. It's a lot more like breast milk. And they did it. We got it through FDA. We're now doing Health Canada. They are a novel food, as they're called, in the EU. We're working on Russia, all of them. A, a large number of agencies have reviewed this and we've been successful in every one. But there's no reason that it has to be that E. coli. You can do this comparable things with algae. Maybe do multiple illegal saccharides. Maybe get the whole chemical profile of the formula. Things like that. That's what I think we're going to be seeing more of and that's what you'll have to be prepped for. I have a question. <clears throat> Regarding the, some of the overlap the agencies have in order to review a chemical, specific chemical, is just only because of the substance or maybe because of the review process that the, that overlap occurs? Which one is that? It's usually your intended use. Intended use. Right. So if you want to put it into food, it's going to go through FDA. Mm -hmm. The exact same substance, no matter how you make it, mm -hmm. if you want to put it into uh, a consumer product like a toy, it goes through EPA. Okay. 
So it's, you want to think about where it's going to be in the end. And it's also important to think about for you guys, what market do you want to be in first? <coughs> if you want to market it to industry first, then you go through EPA and then you can start working on pinning everything down, getting your safety studies done for the, uh, for the food product, maybe put that a couple of years out because it's, uh, you're going to have to do a 90-day toxicology study in rats, dietary feeding study, and it's a called a 90-day study, and I guarantee you it will take a year, and it will cost about $120,000. It's uh, only going to get more expensive. So, so intended use, is that different from the point of application? So, for example, like if it goes as an ingredient or you know, as, as a component of, a, of another product, mm -hmm. so how does it work? Like, is that point of application different than intended use? If it's going to end up as part of a food, it's going to be FDA. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to use it as part of making a food contact material, that's FDA, but that's slightly different. That's a food contact notification. And a food contact notification is actually quite similar to a uh, pre-manufacturing notification or PMN under EPA. You can also look up the S FCN inventory uh, on the FDA site. And you can see how much different it is. Much like EPA's inventory, you won't see the dossier that they used to tell EPA it's safe. EPA will say how much you can use and where it can be used. But, uh, and the FDA will too on the FCN. But the, uh, the grass notification, if you go to the grass notification, you will see the manufacturing process. You will see the history of use. You will see uh, safety data. You will see the expert panels uh, report, all of that. And you will see how they did their dietary assessment. So it's quite a bit different. It would be hundreds of pages. The other thing to uh, keep in mind is when you're looking at the, the grass notification is that if you're looking for your substance or something else that's comparable, Keep in mind that the manufacturing process is much more important there than it is for EPA. Uh, unless if EPA is get, finds out you're doing byproducts or there's other residuals, that's one thing. But when you're dealing with the FDA, when you change the manufacturing process, you can completely change the residuals and the byproducts. That affects the safety. EPA is, and FDA have different ideas slightly different ideas about what the product identity is and manufacturing is a much more part of that identity with FDA. Uh, here's a good example. When you're making a, uh, an algal powder and, or anything from a high chlorophyll content, your processing can induce the creation of chemicals called pheophorbides. And these pheophorbides, when they're ingested, uh, they, they're just formed naturally from the chlorophyll, so it's not like you contaminate it with anything, but your processing can. But when you ingest these pheophorbides, it can cause uh, UV sensitivity. They're photosensitizers. So there's been folks, uh, Japan has a, a standard for, uh, they have a, a regulatory limit for pheophorbides. Some folks have um, some nori with excessive pheophorbides. They're at a rooftop party. They all got these horrible sunburn rashes, and they traced it back to high pheophorbide content in the sushi wrap. So it seems innocuous because you're thinking the whole time you're just processing algae. But how you process it can form other toxins that you just not, may not be aware of. So when it comes to manufacturing both of these processes, you could do either something under FDCA or you can do something under TSCA. You can keep them entirely different entirely separate. That's probably, that's the way they want to see it going, by the way. When this started, FFDCA is from, I mean, this is 1938. It's got some old wonky stuff in it. Grass wasn't established till, until 1958. Again, generally recognized as safe, generally recognized. When you put something in that dossier, you're not going to be allowed to put anything into that, into that dossier that is confidential because you can't have, that's related to the safety anyway, because you can't have a general recognition of safety if people don't know your, how you did it. 
I mean, conceptually, it's just not there. So FDA has been getting more and more challenging on this. Uh, originally, if you wanted something that was confidential, you put it in a in an appendix, and you didn't submit that, or you block call that confidential business information. Anymore, uh, just in the recent one we did, they said um, there's absolutely nothing in anything you send us can be confidential. You want to protect it? You go get a patent. So it's quite a bit different than than EPA. You can, but actually, under Lautenberg, that just changed this summer as well. So CBI is much less well protected. Be prepared to patent. The dietary supplement industry got recognized with a completely different submission process in 1994. 2002, tied onto the Bioterrorism Act, after 9-11, you have to register your facility. Peanut Corporation of America poisoned tons of people with their contaminated product. FDA said uh, we had no idea that this facility was even there in Texas. Apparently, they had originally uh, registered as a storage facility. What they ended up doing was a lot of peanut processing. It was filth everywhere. It contaminated just about everybody's brand of peanut butter because it was a very big, very common place to have it done. Now, under the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA, in 2011, you have to re-register whenever you change what you do and update your registration every two years. FISMA was huge for industry. It was so big that some of the first rules to actually come out of it only started coming out this past year. So again, you have a completely re revised food regulatory system. You have a completely revised chemical regulatory system all within the last couple of years. Um, you guys are on the forefront of this. Uh, FISMA is much more challenging and much more difficult than it was before. If you want to get something from your algal product, if you want to get that to market, EPA is still the fastest route industrial uses. We have to talk about something called good manufacturing practice, usually abbreviated CGMP for current good manufacturing practice. It does not make better food. It makes traceable food. When something goes bad, when it's stored improperly, you can go back through the manufacturing process and you can, you can track down what went wrong and where. So that's exactly what you know, Soylent was doing. They're like, all right, what do we think our problem is here and where in our food chain, where literally uh, did it break down? One of the most common things I've seen is folks going through a broker where they don't actually know the source of the material and the broker has very poor data, very poor paperwork. Uh, you've got to watch out for that. There are certain sources that are much more challenging than others. It doesn't matter where in the world it's made. If it comes into the United States in our food, it's subject to this. If you have a <laughs> facility in the Middle East, in Asia, in, in uh, South America, they have to be registered with the FDA. They're not extra jurisdictional. That food, that whatever they're making is coming into our food, so it has to be registered. And FDA can and will uh, audit the facility. One of the keys here is to understand whether the material is actually food grade and what food grade means. Food grade isn't something that has been determined necessarily by FDA. Let's look at these two different supply chains. This might be a little hard, but um, it's very important to understand the top, the top part here is FDA. The bottom part is, is TSCA. <coughs> the importance to understand is exactly how things used to work versus how they have changed. If your adipic acid was coming through it, you know, any of these sources in the 20th century, it wouldn't have been a big deal. They would have said, fine, uh, is it GMP? Sure, we said it was GMP. Uh, we've got some extra here. We can't sell to the nylon folks. Send it off to the FDA folks, to the, to the food ingredient people. That used to be the way it went. Good go. Often, 
And what's much more common is you make a food grade product and if you don't have the market, you shunt it off to a non-food grade facility. Uh, you're making um, gum Arabic and Wrigley wants to pay you one price and the fracking community wants to pay you another. It all goes over. If it's a lot higher in fracking, they'll take it. And they did. And they, they really disrupted the market by taking out uh, the gums from the uh, food ingredient manufacturers, but they upped what they were willing to pay. Now, if you're making it for the fracking community and it's not food grade and that market bottoms out, you can't turn around and sell it to the, to the candy makers. That you can't do. One of the things they added under the 21st century is food is facility registration, the CGMP, preventive controls, and product tracing all across the board. Nobody cares about that under TASCA. All of these now are very important under, under FISMA and the FDCA. Sure. So how, how does the supply chain uh, changes through, uh, throughout the product, how does that affect uh, from the regulatory standpoint? Here, here's how it gets affected. If you are making an FDA product, everything about your stuff has to be FDA regulated material from the get-go. Uh, you have to set specifications. They have to be met. Your suppliers all have to be aware that it's going into the food material all the way across. See, all the way from the substance all right out to the consumer. And if you're growing an algae, you have to be cognizant of the fact that if you're going to be using the whole biomass that what the nutrients and the things you're using in there those have to be uh, evaluated to determine whether they are okay to be used in that algae biomass if they're going to stay in there if you're going to be taking a chemical out and using that as a food ingredient then you can sort of break that down a little further up the chain and start setting your specifications at the chemical Okay, that's very important. What is your food product? And at what point in your supply chain does it start becoming a food product and, or a food ingredient and, and do all of your source materials have to be food grade? So that can go all the way back. Uh, you're, the challenge has been and, and will be for the next few years for people to develop the appropriate pathways and their brokers and their suppliers. Uh, we recently worked for an oil refinery and they were bringing in um, uh, a mineral oil from China and they, they wanted to use it in food contact material. In food contact there is the uh, there are the code of federal regulations that say what the parameters were. So for them they said we want to start out with food contact, but eventually we might want to use this mineral oil in foods. What we did for them was show them what regulations they need to meet to be under the food contact and how much broader their responsibilities get when they move into a food ingredient. Exact same product for those two uses, not to mention the exact same product for their industrial uses. So what they decided was when it comes into the US, we're going to test it for food grade requirements under the CFRs. And if it meets those, we'll use it for our food contact. What would change, one, one key aspect that would change is now they want to call it a food ingredient and use it in, in actual foods, not just food contact. Then what happens is their supplier in China has to register as a food facility and then becomes subject to all the food regulations. And they're like, no, we're not selling you this mineral oil as a food. They didn't want to know, they wanted no part of that. They didn't have, you know, it's just too much work for them to document. It means more people and it gets very expensive and hence the cost is higher. So what they agreed to do is like they'll, they'll keep supplying it to them as long as these folks are only going to use it as food contact. There are other options um, available. I don't want to limit it to that, but basically that's the bottom line is where is the source? Is it the U.S. with the food specs, or is it China with the manufacturing? It depends on what you're making and your end uses. End uses. End uses.
So who has to register? Anyone manufacturing, processing, packing, or holding food in the U.S. That should pretty well cover it. <laughs> That's everything. So you need to determine if where you're getting your materials, foreign or domestic, if they're registered with FDA. There's a thing also now called preventive controls. It should be a good exercise regardless, but basically they took the requirements that people used to have to do for infant formula and canned foods and seafood, which had a whole lot of regulatory work they had to do, and basically made it the same for everybody else, just slightly less difficult to get to. So you have to evaluate everything, including terrorism. How easy is it for someone to get into your facility and contaminate all your product and get it out? It doesn't mean you have to hire armed guards. It's just like, is this something you have thought about and addressed? Yes, we put up 10-foot fences all the way around, and it has razor wire. We're done. Or maybe not even razor wire. We just put fences. We have locked gates. We, don't, we have a guard at the front, the only real entrance. Emergency exits, set off alarms, things like that. That's what it means to consider terrorism, not that... Not that you have to have the paramilitary. But we also have a foreign supplier verification program now. They're really cracking down on where it's from and, and whether those people can be selling in the U.S. You can get qualified under a special program as uh, the, the qualified importer, the voluntary qualified importer program. You can get your stuff evaluated and checked off and signed off on, and you'll be considered a step above, and they won't have to worry about it but everybody will be subject to the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. That's exactly what it sounds like. They're going to <laughs> verify your foreign supplier. They have to do preventive controls and guarantee that their product is not adulterated. Again, they've just moved your responsibility up the notch to the supplier. You don't get to just sign off and say, well, they told us it was good. That doesn't cut it anymore. You actually have to do the research. Keep that in mind when you're getting your nutrients, when you're getting your products to grow your algae. The brand name, I think, is going to become more and more important. You're, there will be fewer and fewer open markets where things that haven't sold for other reasons are just dumped because you won't be able to trace it. If you can't trace it, you can't use it. Uh, this actually has been updated. I didn't get to this slide. Uh, all these rules are on the FDA site. A uh, number of them have recently been finalized. Draft has taken a couple of years. So here's what we really think this will expose. I was referring to those that fall under TSCA and FDCA. Those are what we call dual channel. Dual channel substances will be exposed under these regulations because you will have to note this who provided it to you if you're making a food ingredient. Then they'll know and they'll look at that supplier and if that supplier isn't registered, they'll find out everyone else who's been buying from them. So when you take substance three and you're trying to get up into the food ingredient manufacturer, you're covered by Tosca, that's where, you're, that's where you're going to come into your inputs, raw materials, and primary production. Are these waste products from other industries? And this is another, this one's key for algae. Waste CO2, waste water. If you're going to go, if you're going to work on a food product using a waste stream from somebody else, you're going to have you're going to have a lot of documentation testing on your inputs and raw materials. That's just how it's going to be. Um, CO2 uh, from a flu, and you're using it to build biomass, and that biomass goes into a polymer. Nobody cares. If that polymer becomes a food contact material, that'll have to be taken into consideration. It's, I know it's frustrating. A lot of folks want to use uh, waste products that are high in nitrogen and everything else. But keep in mind, and someone said this to me at a conference, and it's a great question. And I'm not, 
I'm not dismissing them. Is the point had to be made. How can we put manure on our crops and we can't use wastewater to grow algae? Well, there's a couple reasons, but one, you can't just dump manure on your crops. There are rules for when and how long before harvest and the quality of that material. So it's not as straightforward as one might think. Now, I think we're going to have to move to this. And I've already seen uh, the National Academies of Sciences, I believe it was, uh, they had commented on whether you can get drinking water from wastewaters. And they're like, yeah, we have the technology. It's expensive. Yeah. If algae product, uh, production were considered more agricultural, would you be able to apply the same standards that they use? for the application of fertilizer if you want to use source water? That's a great question. Uh, I think what would happen is, and we're seeing this more and more, is the agencies get together and figure out who has jurisdiction and then they work on a memorandum of understanding. <coughs> so if you want to use a pesticide on a drinking fountain, F EPA talks to FDA. So everybody's, everybody's aware of what's going on or uh, something like that. And I think USDA would get involved with FDA. I think what would happen is, again, the end use would come into play. If you're just using a biomass as the food for the end result, that's one thing, because you have much less opportunity to, for refinement. If you're extracting a particular chemical that you want to use, or some fraction thereof of the biomass, if you want to extract that and use it for uh, a very specific food ingredient application, that might have a different bar because you're refining it several steps down the line chemically or any different way, physically, chemically. But the, ref the level of refinement is such that you can get it out. I recall looking at one algae dossier where they were using uh, a cobalt micronutrient. And cobalt sensitizer and potential carcinogen and they, I, I, they had pulled their dossier. It was withdrawn. FDA will tell you this isn't going to go through. But it, it was withdrawn, and then it was resubmitted, and I noticed that the cobalt was no longer in their nutrient list. And I talked to one of the folks at a conference. I said, did FDA get excited about that, or did they prefer you take it out? They said, yeah, they, they wanted us to take it out, and so they did. But something like that, may or may not have a, a huge impact on your production. I think it might have come down to how much they were using and how much their fortification level was. So nothing is just a cut and dry yes or no. If they want to use a fertilizer or a, a manure uh, as an input source on a crop, and you know, if, when you say it like that, it's just like, well, it depends on the crop. And I haven't looked at those regulations, but I suspect it's not always the same, particularly given the issues they had with um, you know, spinach in California and, uh, and the E. coli. So I think it really matters, but that's something to keep in mind. I'm not saying you shouldn't think of it. Just be prepared for some of the questions that might come up. One of the things we're going to do in product tracing is institute key data elements and critical tracking events. You guys are scientists and engineers. It's just another, it's just more documentation. You want to know what's your lot number, which if you make, if you do a full fermentation, you get all your algae out in one, you drop that tank and you've got a batch, that's easy enough. But what happens when you're doing continual production? What does that mean for a lot number? Is that everything you make in a day or a week? So you need to come up with lot numbers that are meaningful, that if something goes wrong, you can identify exactly what was affected. You don't want something that's so large that you have to do a recall on everything you've made for the past month and a half, but you don't want something that's so small that you miss other potential contaminations. Critical tracking events, uh, these are going to be, uh, well, let's take a look at the, um, the graph real quick and we'll take a look at it but the product tracing will expose these supply chain issues I guarantee it when they're gonna say 
what temperature was this stored at? Um, did it go above or below that? What's your specification for storage? Things like that. Here we have a critical tracking event. Source one goes into transport one. Who picked it up? What temperature? How was it held? Who signed off on it? Transport one takes it to the broker and storage. All that information again. Broker and storage over to the ingredient manufacturer. They get rid of it. They log it. They take it down to the formulator. The formulator has to log everything. It's going to go all the way through out to the retail. The only one who doesn't have to record it is the consumer. This is what they're working on instituting so that nothing is missed in the entire supply chain. If you have multiple materials and multiple sources, you'll know and it will be captured and you'll know exactly what lot number that went into. Oh good, I'm doing very well here. So the, again, Tosca and FDCA have even more similarities now than they did just a few months ago. What you have is you have a chemical regardless of whether you're using it in a food or not. All scientists and engineers, we know that. What you need to understand is exactly what that is. It's not just spirulina. It's spirulina of a certain variety grown a certain way. And what is it used for? It's used in a very specific set of products at this level. And then what regulatory path does that put you down? And how do you document it, support it, and show your customers that you've met the regulatory obligations? If we go back to Soylent and we think about what happened there, and Soylent says that it's the algal flower. And so far, no one's identified a contaminant in that. So is it the algal flower itself, or did something go wrong with a couple of batches? It's product tracing. That's exactly what they're going to be going through and trying to find out. Is this something that is a result of someone storing it poorly? Is this the result of somebody handling it different? Did they, did they change? Did the algal flower manufacturer change a source? Did they get a new material? Uh, do they have all the safety studies uh, to uh, shore up that they've done it? Well, if they went grass and then didn't go to FDA, that would, that would concern me as a company owner or a worker. But they have FDA. FDA take, took a look at this and said, we think the flower is, we don't have any questions at this time. Remember that we didn't approve it. FDA said, we don't have any questions at this time. FDA might have questions now. Grass isn't permanent. It can be revoked. Food contact notifications are not permanent. They can and have been revoked. Perfluorinated substances that keep uh, the grease from soaking through your, your hamburger wrapper, they re revoked the, the FCN for a lot of those substances. You can't use those anymore. The uh, you know, Tosca under EPA, they've banned a number of chemicals. They're probably going to ban a few more now under Lautenberg. So just because you've got to market doesn't mean you get to stay there. You have to maintain the regulatory work so that you can stay on market. And that's going to, that's a lot of what this new framework is supposed to do is help you keep that, keep that uh, well managed. Does anyone have any specific questions? I do. So if, if you have to leave the class with questions about how the regulatory process works with algae products, what those questions would be so in their mind to solve after your lecture. Something to think about for the class? You know. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend, given the situation that happened this morning, is just go look at the GRN inventory and look at, look at how those three Solazyme um, dossiers, those submissions changed. And if you look at the differences in those, you can see, you can figure out what happened and think about how that would affect what, what you've seen. You guys have done manufacturing or any processes or anything um, for algae production. I don't know if you've covered that much yet, but compare that to, you know, think about that with respect to a bioreactor versus a pond. 
I know. Look at those and figure out what Terra Via is going to do. It's, it's actually it's pretty straightforward. One question is that you touched on wastewater. Mm -hmm. uh, articles that this week on wastewater for beer. Mm -hmm. And so, have you had any cases related to that yet? I haven't. Um, uh, I was a brewer. I've brewed a lot of beer. And I have had contaminated batches, actually. Uh, that, that, that's, there's some concern for me. Uh, you know, if I was looking for some of the best water around, I'd probably go with whatever Coca-Cola or Pepsi was starting with. Because those folks are going to absolutely guarantee that they have the best water to begin with. Now, it seems to me that if they were going to start using wastewater in those, that it would cost an absolute arm and a leg to get the water up to their standards. Can you have something like the yeast or anything else help you in that process? I'll hold off. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not as optimistic on that aspect as I am a lot of the other potential for algae. I think that's going to take the longest to achieve. Um, and just almost exclusively because of cost, not because of the possibility or the potential. I just think it's going to be very expensive. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Stewart, for the excellent lecture. I think um, I just want to touch a lot of uh, points on the regulatory side of algal products. And also, it kind of complements our last lecture next week would be about business development and how really algae could get in the market. But given all those circumstances with a regulatory standpoint and also the potential that there is but how to <coughs> exploit it using all the regulatory uh, systems to our benefit. Thank you so much and I really appreciate you being here sure. and uh, uh, this is what we actually needed to kind of uh, conclude our lecture on the algae products before we take the <coughs> GS strain and a GM and what exactly those are in aspects of uh, uh, producing algae for the specific purposes. Well, um, if there's no questions, that'll be our conclusion for this lecture. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate that.